Hi there. This is uh, Mandi on Astral Oracles, and I'm, I'm going to uh, channel the Arcturians on um, the matter of uh, language seen from an extra dimensional perspective. And I knew some Spanish before I got here, but uh, it's still been very interesting. Um, like not being fluent in a language, it's, it's that thing that when, when there are several uh, parts of a sentence that you don't understand, it, it's, it's hard to pinpoint um, exactly what it is you're not understanding about what is being communicated uh, to you. And, uh, and therefore, of course, it's also uh, kind of difficult to, uh, to navigate in sometimes. But at the same time, I really noticed that it, it is like very much an energetic space on its own. Like it has certain baseline frequencies. And, uh, and well, particularly with Spanish, I feel, because it is also a very uh, expressive um, uh, culture, an outward culture, uh, that, that, that you get this impression that there's a, like an underlying emotional current that you pick up on and then, then the words, they, they sort of attach themselves to that current and, and then you try to discern from that. So, so even though you're not necessarily understanding what it is people are communicating to you exactly, you usually pick up on the baseline intentions and, and emotions of, um, of what's going on. And I feel like that that's very interesting. Uh, like I, I, I've also grown into the habit of, of when I, I get upset with it. It, I, it only happened one uh, one time here, and but but it's well, get so upset with someone who's uh, who's yelling at me that I just start responding in Danish because I know that that even though they don't understand it, they will definitely pick up on that intention that okay, I'm really not okay with what's going on here, and I'm I'm going to communicate it in this. A very harsh and guttural tongue, which you will also find like somewhat intimidating. So, so that's uh, that's interesting. And of course, I also noticed that there's the interesting element that we tend to, uh, the human mind tends to perceive things that it can't comprehend in that way as slightly aggressive. So I've heard the notion down here that they find uh, German, for instance, very aggressive. And and I think we have the opposite notion that we really find like Latin languages. Uh, very outwardly uh, confrontational and it, it essentially just happens uh, with because your mind doesn't know what to to make of it and then then of course like those circuits that is something going on here that uh, that might be detrimental to my well-being like that they kick in as an instinct and I, I think that's um, that's very interesting because there are like these baseline energies and and also this sort of baseline personality ingrained in a language and of course when you're dealing with huge languages such as uh, English and, and Spanish which spans many cultures and um, many climates and, and uh, many different uh, historical developments it's also very interesting to to sort of try to discern that okay what are the nuances here that are being communicated because what I've also picked up is the like the, the more I learn Spanish here, the, 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 the more folksy I think I actually sound to people who speak like a more standard type of Spanish. Like it's going to Andalusia is perhaps the equi equivalent of going to Yorkshire to, to learn English. Like it's, it's very charming, but it's also something that, that would actually come off as, as kind of incomprehensible to a, a lot of the, the standard speakers of, of the language who, who perhaps speaks um, like a broader dialect, like Mexican is definitely uh, easier to um, to understand on the ears and, and that also goes for, for most American accents compared to uh, a lot of a lot of the British when she, once you you get far enough away from London so so in that way I, I feel it, it's been really interesting trying to to perceive and discern these emotions that are um, that are coming forward in in the language and um, and what I notice and what I, I often talk to the Arcturians about, is also like one of the things they really appreciate about the experiences I communicate back to them is is exactly that uh, wonder of, of language like what is it actually because it's a very human mode of, of expression and I I guess what it essentially is is it, it's actually the 4D perception so it, it has a lot to do with being a sort of time machine and I believe this has also come forward before, but, but the idea that you actually transpose your consciousness into a type of symbolic, timeless uh, perception, uh, which is hidden in the word, 
but it of course also distracts you from the real world world or immediate uh, perception so in that way it, it's both a blessing and a curse and uh, and it is my impression as we move into the 5d um, languages themselves are also changing and um, and we observe for instance how well you know emotional experience uh, again comes to the to the forefront so so what you can say about the twitterverse and uh, and online communication and, and netspeak is is of course also that it it constitutes uh, a move away from from that very elaborate literal tradition of of phrasing yourself in in expositions and then moves on into uh, emoticons and acronyms and uh, abbreviations and, and all these types of, um, of, of, let us say, more condensed expressions where you're just supposed to discern the meaning behind it rather than, than dwell on all, all the nuances that are, that are brought forward. So I thought let's bring in the Arcturians and see what they have to say about uh, uh, their perception of language and where we are, we are going with this. So thank you for being here guys, I hope you enjoy. Yes, and hello, friends. See, quite interestingly, as I would like to introduce myself as Umblam of the Arcturian Council and extend my love and blessings to you, but, but you are already aware that we mean very well and, and, and we are very, very fascinated by the human experience and, and what you are also able to, to teach us. But it's interesting that this energy coming forward today on my position um, in it is it's less collective and more individualized and and that has to do with, with what's being channeled and translated right now well it's being channeled channeled and translated more from my point in what you would construe as the the past or, or in my physical incarnation as an actual physical uh, being on our planet circling the star Arcturus, and and that's where we get the name so so it it's, it's to underscore that our relationship to language and our perception of it and our ability to interact with it is very much also connected to the idea that well of the individualized experience essentially of the experience of personal perception and that's of course interesting because language is at the same time a very very collective um, expression so as you may know, humans are often as dependent on actually being able to access the semantic um, expression as they are on, well, being able to access social energies of care and belonging or being able to access um, the air that you breathe. It's a type of element. And that's why it's not a bad idea to construe it as a dimension because it is the hallmark expression of the four-dimensional experience. So when you moved into the perception of time, you became aware that things are transmutable. And when you became, become aware of things being transmutable, you also try to control them or pin them down. So that's no problem in, in the third dimensional experience because things appear as they are in that moment there's there's no level of extra analysis um, to speak of while when you translate things into the dimension of of language that is you you pick up the shapes in space and then you put them into the realm of time you also figure out that there are a lot of nuances that you can apply to this and so you also become aware of that philosophical dilemma that how is it that I'm actually perceiving a shape as a whole or a unity? Because it's actually a lot of disunited units. So breaking things up in semantics and symbols and appearances or apparitions, we could almost say the things that come forward and present themselves to you. 
you also sense the fleeting character of this, that it is almost as if there's a substance that underlines these things that language is pointing to, but that it can't enter into because it needs to put one thing of that object, of the perception, in the foreground of your experience. And then, and then it, it, it has to... It has to shift other things into the background to be able to, to do that. So language is also something that points to how you direct your attention. So when you are working with language, and when we are working with language being translated in an individual such as, as this, you are essentially molding perception. You are bringing out parts of reality to be better understood, and you are using the ability of concentration to do that. So much as you know that, that the animals centered in a, and we use the term lower, but centered in a lower density experience, that, that they exist in, in a more immediate relationship to the outside world. You figure out when you work with language and once you become conscious of the language that you bring forward, the words that you speak within and the words that you speak without, that this is also a discipline of concentration. So you actually have the ability to choose certain words carefully and then be able to see how they mold reality. And that's quite interesting that this symbolic relationship of the abstract to the real, it's a bridge that you cross through working through languages. But at the same time, you are working within a model that is already constructed. So you are working within something that is not static at all, but at the same time is defined by all the other inputs into this language that have been made before you and that you are carrying through you in that perception. In that idea, you could think of language as its own type of consciousness. And it is a type of storeroom that exists within time where you can then retrieve the notions and ideas of what has already been forward by accessing this and expressing it. And that's, that's something that we would like you to encourage, encourage you to, to do, to also figure out well, how is it that you are interacting with these energies? How are the words you are using feeding into your baseline frequency? And how is your baseline frequency shaping the world, words that you are using? Because words are indeed quite powerful. They are composite symbols that bring forward certain configurations. It's a type of summoning in that sense. Every time you speak, you summon reality. And therefore, it can be helpful to begin to perceive these systems, this language, as something that is transpersonal, something that is acting through you and that you are acting on as an agent of that greater current running through you rather than it, what it is often construed as in the individual consciousness, that is that notion of self-thought or uh, self-talk or thought or reflection, which comes, is constantly running and which is constantly casting spells within on your self-perception and bringing notions forward that I am this thing and I'm, I'm this thing and not that thing and I have that name and not that name. And of course, you are, from our perspective, all these things. So you are the framework that upholds this. And that's what you can think of as the Akashic of the 5D. It's the framework, it's the ether that you're realizing that makes all these energies possible. So ingrained within this are the greater energetic patterns. Ingrained within the Akashic are the greater energetic patterns that are connected. So where language essentially separates and by separation brings out something outstanding. The Akashic integrates, and by integration it brings out something holistic, 
well, and, and by holistic, we mean, mean the sense of belonging, the sense of interconnection, the sense that you are a part of a greater unfolding, that you are a creative agent within. And so language serves many functions, but you could say that the specific function of poetry is actually the re the rewiring of language to bring you back to immediate reality. So it's it's the connection of these planes that language has separated you from with language itself. It's something that that begins to remind you that you are in fact something greater. And therefore also every time you engage with poetry, and we mean this in the broad sense, not just as stances in a book, but, but, but with the idea that it's the living language, it's the language that awaken the sense of you being something more than you are. And fiction, in a sense, has the same quality because it brings forward this sense of participation in a reality that's not immediate to you and yet seems to reform your immediate reality by levels of recognition, by levels of explanation, by levels of expansion and understanding. These are all perspectives that you can use to understand this specific and very human type of expression. So notice that all ascended species have usually had this move through the fourth dimension, that is the symbolic dimension, the dimension where abstraction becomes tacked onto what you call physical reality or the more dense densities. And, but it's very, very difficult how they do it. And you know from observing species on your own planet that, well, there are loads of complex types of communication that are construed through different cues, sensory cues. So we point, for instance, to the octopus. And some species here are able to communicate through color instead. There are, of course, also the type of sonar communication that takes place, which is also, you might construe it as audio, but again, it, it relates more to the idea of the echo or the landscape as vibrations. And, and that's a different way of construing it. So all alien species have quite their unique take on it. And that's also why it's, it's in many ways, we are able to do this because we have learned so much about you. And a lot of species will be able to do this, but in a sense, translating alien energies into English is something that's, it's, <laughs> It's quite difficult because understand that this is an even greater leap in a sense than the octopus trying to speak English to you. It would require a very great deal of understanding from the part of the octopus to be able to do this. And you haven't been able to master really communicating with other species on your planet. So therefore also know that this is a process that is still developing, but that you are moving into more elaborate sensory types of language, that is, types of language that integrate different separate parts of experience. And so you could, for instance, construe your virtual reality as a type of language, a type of complex semantic code that's connected and then wired into several senses at, at once and not only the auditory sense and not only the vocal cords, but visuality at the same time the sense of perception at the same time. So, and this is, well, we would use the term holistic again. It's more hologrammatic. And it's something to play around with because you, you can't go wrong in it. But it is true that there are certain baseline energies as we read them in your different languages. And that means that, that you are always approaching this dimension from different angles. And, and of course, that's that phenomen phenomen phenomenological truth that you are already always acting on energies already working through you. So therefore, it's important to recognize and you do this, for instance, through 
elaborate symbolic systems such as astrology, that you are working from certain baseline energetic configurations. And so it would do no good to go to Mongolia and, and to, to start to speak Arabic to them because that, that would be two energetic currents that are not necessarily aligned and that would need a lot of work to begin to reach each other and to connect. And therefore, be happy with the energies that you have chosen. Because from the perspective of your higher selves, you have chosen to find these energies and begin to work with and configure them from the baseline. And you are all adding to the development of this collective reality as you push forward and onward into the exploration of human experience. And some of these baseline qualities, they are of course connected to the landscapes or, or the basic energies. So we were, f we were, for instance, listening as this vessel described his experience of the Spanish language. And this is a, and when he says that the language is seen as somewhat, if not aggressive, then, then very directed outward, that has to do with the quality of heat. So the quality of heat is a quality that begins to mold barriers open and that is more within the potential space of exchange rather than the more sparse configuration of, of the cool temper, which economizes with the energies that it wants to bring forward and which is more inclined to, let us say, private experience or the idea of separation and the separate exploration of the inner dimensions. And this is something that has been so defining for, human uh, for the human species through your history that you were set in these climates that it's it's a bit shocking or let us say overwhelming to you that you now live in environments where you are able to well for a lot of you move around in different climates landscapes configurations landscapes cultures but also that you are able to essentially configure your environment that is your living environment by adding heat or cooling it down and thereby creating a more malleable state of all the energies that you work within. And so there is this sense of consciously creating a framework and then allowing that, then allowing that impulse of language to flow through that framework, allowing your exploration of the symbolic to take on a conscious character and for you to create the spaces, be they hot or cold, that you want to interact with and bring forward and for you to invest those with sentimental reality, for you to invest those with the connecting bridge of the symbol that leads you from this dense reality and into the ever-flowing connection of the energetic current that you know as the five di uh, fifth dimension. We sense that this has been quite a complex talk to register and comprehend for the human mind, we can at least register that this is a quite confused individual that is trying to process all the implications of what it is that we have said to you, as we also use some of the baseline structures within him to translate our message into something that is, at least on paper, should we use that expression, understandable to a human being that also works these codes of English. Therefore, I would love to leave you with that. And I would like to leave you with the idea that in my time, I experimented a lot with language, but the experiments that I carried out, it was more, if, if you could think of it as floating orbs of light, that when you touch them or interact act with them, fill you with spells and incantations, fills you with melodies and fills you with emotional sensation. 
So what would be comparable to it was that if you were to read a book, you would consume all the content and essentially the emotional configuration in one go. That was, that was my highest joy and excitement when I was alive and a physical being. And it's something I transmit to you as well. So approaching it, I have given you all these linguistic symbolic codes, but I will all also leave you with a vibrational incantation that's able to convey emotion in a more clear and direct, straightforward manner. To me, that was an actorium poem on the strangeness of the human condition. And with that, I leave you with my deepest love and blessings. Goodbye, dear human beings. Thank you for being those humans. <laughs>